Welcome to the next episode of, in season one of, of RHC Medicare Telehealth Part A Billing. If you haven't already gone down to Best Buy and got the uh, full DVD set, um, this will just be adding <laughs> one more to that to that set. Um, unfortunately, we we've we've met um, way too many times in the last few weeks uh, regarding this issue and. This is one more time. Uh, hopefully this will be the last time. Uh, we do want to thank Azalea Health and Chartspan for uh, helping us to put these on free of charge. Uh, uh, we appreciate their sponsorship uh, very much. My name is Mark Lynn. I'm a CPA from Chattanooga. I'm an RHC consultant. I worked at the RHC program now for some 30 something years. Uh, Danny Gilbert is a RHC consultant who hasn't worked with the RHC program for some 30, 30 something years, but she will be one of our panelists and will be handling uh, the questions and uh, information behind the scenes there. So if you have issues there, uh, Danny will be taking, taking care of that and keeping this train on its tracks, hopefully. If you've not become a member of the Rural Health Clinic Information Group, please do so. We've grown from 850 members pre-COVID to almost 1,600 post-COVID, or I guess during COVID now. So, and we do want to thank all the contributors to the RHC Information Group. A lot of the people that will be speaking today, uh, they've worked tirelessly for RHCs during this time by answering questions on the NARHC listserv, by on all the different state associations, and by answering them on the Rural Health Clinic Information Exchange and helping people to understand the chaos uh, that we're going through. Uh, there is this, the services that healthcare business specialists provide. I won't spend a lot of time on that because that'll sound too advertising, but we will, we, but there is the slide just in case. If you are looking for the recording of this webinar, it is being recorded. If you have an issue with that, you're please feel free to, to log off at this time. But we are recording it. It's, I don't know <laughs> if it's like the other ones. I don't know how effective it is to actually record it because it will probably be out of date in about two or three more days days from now. But we are going to record it just for the sake of, the sake of doing so. Uh, that recording will be, uh, there will be a link to it at ruralhealthclinic.com COVID-19. Your presentations will be there as well from Nathan, uh, Patty and and all th those four those three presentations are over in your handouts right now. If you if you want to get a hold of them there, we did send out the presentations uh, uh, this morning to some of you guys. Google Google Mail got angry with me for sending out too many emails and stopped letting me do that at some point in the morning. So some of you may not have gotten that. I'm I'm shocked that they would be be upset for me with that for that but they did so uh so uh so that's where that that's that um disclaimer all this stuff is brand new it just came out yesterday some of your questions we may not be able to answer uh some of them we may have different different answers and that's okay because we're all we're learning this we none of us have a playbook for dealing with a pandemic the last time i was in one in 1918 things were just a little bit different uh back then but uh, this one is a lot different than, than that one a few years ago. Uh, if you do have questions, wait till the end till all the presenters have talked because we've learned this from, from Nathan, from NARHC's presentations and from our presentations in the past is you're just going to fill up that question box and it's going to have 200 questions in it and you're not going to get your questions answered. So wait till the end of the session. And then if you still don't have an answer, then please answer, ask that question. And we will have a little bit of time at the end of the session to try to, to answer things that you're still confused about. Uh, here is the agenda. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm a little bit long winded here. I'm, I'm taking up more than my five minutes. Ellen Knowles from Azalea Health will be on just in a second with a sponsor message. She'll spend about two minutes on that. And then uh, I will introduce the speakers. Then Nathan will come on and do his Washington uh, update. That should take 10, 15 minutes or so. Then Charles and Shannon Chambers, Charles James and Shannon Chambers and I will go through hopefully about 20 minutes or so on this revised SE 2016. And I will stop in certain sections there for panelists to, to, uh, to, uh, to comment or to, to help us as we have questions as we go through there. 
Patty Harper will come on at about in about 12:45 and go over some documentation and some some things like that. Uh, and then Julie Quinn, Julie will be here from HSA to do a to do about 10, 15 minutes or so on cost reporting. And then uh, Douglas Swords is with us. He's one of the co-founders of Azalea. He will be a panelist with us as well when he gets on online. So, so uh, Azalea, uh, Ellen, or I think, and I see Douglas is here as well. So if you guys want to spend a couple minutes telling us about Azalea, this is the time to do it. All right. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone, and happy Friday. I'm Ellen Knowles. I am the Marketing Communications Manager at Azalea Health. Um, we work with rural health cl clinics across the U.S., and um, we really work to provide them with simple and affordable solutions to help keep you all connected to your patients, especially during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I wanted to share that Azalea has a fully integrated and secure telehealth platform um, currently for all of our Azalea clients, they have full access to that telehealth platform free. And for any RHCs of you on the line today, um, if you're in the market for a new EHR with telehealth functionality, we're also providing that free to you for a full year. Um, and then for any of practices who want to stick with your current EHR provider and are just looking to add a telehealth solution um, as part of your current platform, we also have a solution like that for you within our remote patient care suite. Um, so we have a lot of different, different solutions. And if you're interested in learning about any of those, just let myself or Mark know following today's webinar and we can get in touch with you. Um, as Mark mentioned, we also have our co-founder and vice president of revenue cycle management at Azalea, Doug Swords on the line, and he will help towards the end of today's presentation, answering any of your questions regarding telehealth billing and um, any of those ongoing guidelines and changes. So thank you so much, Mark, for letting us be a part of today's presentation and for all of the help and guidance you're providing. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it back to you. Okay, Ellen, thank you very much. And, and I, I think we do need to re-talk re about this sponsorship deal. I had no idea it was going to be doing so many of these things here. So so uh, I'm teasing you. But thank you very much to Azalea <laughs> and Chargespan for sponsoring these. Hopefully, we won't do as many of these in the future. And we can actually get back to doing seminars and, and talking to each other face to face because that, that tends to work better uh, for me. Uh, panelists, we panelists and speakers here, we got like I said, we have a great lineup of people that really know uh, the RHC stuff. When you see my presentation, you're going to see th something that's purple is going to be panelist questions will show up on there. Those are questions you guys have asked me or asked on the RHC information group. A lot of them are a little bit harder ones that I didn't really know the answer to. So I'm hoping the panelists will help me and help you to uh, to understand that. So panelists, whenever we get to the stuff that's in purple, that means I'm going to stop and say you guys can can talk and remember to turn your mic on when you start doing that because that's a we won't hear you unless you turn your mic on. So uh, our first speaker is going to be Nathan Baugh. He is the Director of Government Affairs for the NARHC. Nathan is from San Diego, has worked with the NARHC for, for five years now, and I think he worked as an intern as well. He is newly engaged, and he is working super hard for rural health clinics. I know uh, he's. Uh, we've had many a late night email exchanges and Sunday nights and weekends. And so Nathan is working supporting RHCs and has really some fantastic news about the telephone visit. So, so we want him to take a victory lap because victory laps are very, very rare uh, in the in the rural health market, it seems like. Of course, Patty Harper with Inquiseek, and they have, a, and her and Jeff have this product called Inquidox, which is just fantastic as far as policies and procedures go. So I always highly recommend people to use that. That's a full-blown compliance system for you guys that, and it's very, for what you get, it is very inexpensive. It's very, very fairly priced. So, so Patty is, I mean, she's just a wealth of knowledge. So, so cumulative. That, that does not surprise me. She's very, 
very smart and a lot of questions I get, I refer them over to Patty because they're because she is so good with that. And of course, Shannon Chambers and Shannon is uh, knows all the Billy and Cody stuff. I listened to a webinar from her the other day. It was it was fantastic as well. And um, uh, she's been with the South Carolina Office of Rural Health, I guess, ever since Marsha Mars, even before Marsha Mars left there. So it's been been a few years and has been working really strongly in the rural health clinic market. Although rumor has it, she's not the greatest UNO player in the world. So uh, we'll we'll let her we'll let her address that as, <laughs> as well. And then Charles James, uh, Charles was on here uh, last time. He's done a lot of the billing presentations. Uh, for the NARHC, and he is a wealth of knowledge as far as billing uh, for rural health clinic goes and FQHCs and sort of a, uh, a jack of all trades as far as knowing about uh, the rural market and about billing and they have a billing company. So so Charles will step in and help me when I go in the weeds on the uh, the billing piece as well. Julie Quinn, everybody knows Julie uh, from all the way back with Riverbend, and now she is with HSA. She is the director of uh, vice president of cost reporting and provider education. You've seen her at the different NARHC meetings and state meetings and traveling all over the country supporting rural health clinics. So we, we appreciate Julie, and she'll be on uh, as far as the cost reporting session at the very end of this, and we'll go about 10 or 15 minutes of that. And Doug Swords, he's a, he is uh, in charge. He's one of the co-founders and the vice president of Azalea. Uh, he does the revenue cycle management for them. So he's going to be uh, in the uh, in the details and in the weeds as far as the, the back end billing cycle. And that will be a great addition to our panelists because some of these things, uh, like I said, I don't I don't really go into the details of that. I'm more of a cost report person. I know the billing rules enough to be sort of dangerous. So so Doug will help us fill in the any gaps that we miss. And so now it's a time where it is Nathan's turn. I am going to turn over my uh, I'm going to make Nathan the person who's going to show his screen. And Nathan, you are now in charge. So we should be able to see your screen. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and I assume folks can see my screen now. I'm making, I'm expanding it. We, we good? can. It's what's good. All right, perfect. Um, so thanks, thanks again to Mark for putting on these webinars and um, giving everyone a chance to to talk to the rural health clinics community. Um, I am going to be talking about big picture, uh, where the telehealth payment policy is, and what we like, what we don't like, and where um, we would like to see it go. Uh, and then we will, the rest of the presentations will be getting into the details of the current policy and things like that. Um, so I think the place to start is just for folks to understand what the current uh, logic is for our fee-for-service peers. So if you're not in a rural health clinic or a FQHC, the way the telehealth works is got a pretty straightforward logic. And this is actually a quote from the Social Security Act, which is the statute. And basically what it says is that whatever service the physician or practitioner provides um, through telehealth should be paid the same as if that service was provided in person, right? So there's essentially no difference between their payment uh, between uh, between an in-person visit and a telehealth visit, they you know use a modifier to indicate that it was done via telehealth, but that's really that doesn't affect their payment at all. So that's the logic that you know dominates Medicare uh, payment for for our fee for service peers. In the rural health clinic, we have an incredibly different payment logic that was put into law in the CARES Act, which is phase three of the COVID-19 legislation. And our logic is essentially to take 190 plus different CPT codes used on the fee schedule, take the average of that to create a single payment rate for our HCs. 
completely different. So we're, it, we'll do 100, one of the 190 different services and we get paid the average of the 190. Um, so a very different payment logic and one that is, in my opinion, not necessarily beneficial for most rural health clinics and has a lot, is, has a lot of long-term problems. Um, and telehealth policy has moved leaps and bounds in the last couple of months as a result of the pandemic. Um, and it's got a lot of uh, room to, to, or a lot of way to go uh, because I do not think that um, these temporary measures are, are gonna be the permanent measures going forward. As the public health emergency unwinds, uh, whenever that may be, we're going to have to figure out what we are keeping, what we're changing, and what is going back to a pre-COVID-19 um, policy. So uh, I think there's going to be a, a more changes to come. So what what is bad about the current telehealth policy for rural health clinics? The most obvious one is that payment for our uncapped RHCs which is most RECs, um, will be below what they would you're going to make in person. So the all-inclusive rate, average all-inclusive rate for our uncapped RECs is in the range of about $220 plus. And obviously for telehealth, we're only going to be paid $92. So that's a big negative about the current telehealth policy. Um, what this does is it dis disincentivizes uh, telehealth in provider-based RITs. You make more money if the patient comes in person, so you're going to encourage the patient to come in person. Um, and it's certainly not the policy that we want to lock in place forevermore. Uh, our fee-for-service peers, if you'll recall, their logic, it doesn't matter whether the visit is in person or through telehealth, they're gonna make the same amount of money. So they're able to utilize telehealth um, without any financial considerations. For our uncapped RHCs, you, every, every patient that you push into a telehealth visit, you're really hurting your revenue. So that, that's obviously um, a major problem with the current telehealth policy. We have um, you know, the complicating factor of the fact that the, tele, the time and costs associated with the telehealth visits um, does not count for um, the RECs all. In I should I should have said all inclusive rate. Uh, it does go on the cost report, but in the non uh, REC cost section, we'll get into that later. Um, but obviously, that that's a major. It it causes a lot of accounting headaches. Uh, there's FTE considerations. There's productivity standard considerations, and all of that is just complicating and um, doesn't mesh well with our, our all-inclusive rate um, payment structure. And the other, the, uh, another problem with this is that our claims data is gonna be entirely inaccurate because instead of filing the code that most uh, approximates the visit and the service provided, we're gonna be filing this G2025 code for everything. So it's, we're, we really have no idea what service was provided. Uh, it's just one of the service, the 190 plus services on that list was provided, but the government and um, from a data perspective, we have no idea what that, what service, which of those services was provided. This has got, um, this basically makes reporting for Quality programs, extremely difficult. I've already had questions uh, from folks that are in ACOs that need to keep track of the uh, annual wellness visits that they're doing. They want to know how do they get um, their annual wellness visits that they provide through telehealth counted towards their ACO if they're not billing the annual wellness visit code. So again, it, it makes quality reporting, which is long-term where healthcare is going, it makes it uh, very difficult if we have uh, inaccurate claims data. 
So those are just a few of the, the problems with the current telehealth policy um, that, that I think we need to address long term. Uh, admittedly, there are some nice things about the current telehealth po po policy. Most recently, as of yesterday, we learned that the audio only visits will now be paid the $92.03. Previously, I was telling people to bill this as G0071, um, but that was really a patchwork band-aid solution to get paid something. Now, however, they are including that in the G2025 code, so you'll be able to uh, get paid those 90, that $92 for an audio only visit. That's, so that's pretty nice. Um, Obviously, the $92.03 for independent RHCs is more than what you make in person. So they have the reverse incentive of our uncapped RHCs. Independent RHCs are incentivized to do as much as they can through telehealth. No, 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 don't come in for that. Let's do it via telehealth. They have that financial incentive. Now, it's only about $6, but nevertheless, um, you know, independent RHCs make more than they would in person. This underscores the fact that our rural health clinic cap or upper payment limit is extraordinarily low. Um, and I'll get to that in just a second. But um, again, that, that is another nice component to the way that this has been set up. Um, and then the other thing that you can look at it as a nice thing about the current telehealth policy, but I think once folks, I think that this will ch absolutely change long term, um, but clinicians that are not considered RHC practitioners traditionally can and therefore like cannot bill in-person encounters, um, they can bill these G2025 services through telehealth and be paid that $92. And the um, sort of most one of the examples that we use is a, a registered nurse performing a 99211 service, a level one established patient ENM. That is now something that you can bill through telehealth and get paid the $92.03. If that same service was performed in person, that would not be a billable REC visit. So there are some nice things about the current telehealth policy. But to be quite frank, I think that the um, government will ratchet down on some of these things and potentially, um, certainly when they make this, whatever changes they're going to make, I don't think that, that this component to the telehealth policy um, is going to be the long-lasting or, 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 or survive COVID-19, um, just because I can see the way that this might be abused, where you put a bunch of RNs into a to an RHC and have them bill telehealth distance site visits, get paid ninety two dollars, and it's a whole sort of um, business scheme. Um, I think that 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 is going to be uh, prohibited some way or another by CMS long term. Um, so, what we are hoping to to do sort of most immediately is that we are going to make a phase four push um, in, in whatever they do for phase four to do two things. Um, we're we're going to, one, try to raise the cap to $92.03 so that it matches our payment for telehealth and our independent REGs are not hurt by the second thing that we're trying to do which is pay RHCs their all-inclusive rate. And we'll throw FQHCs into this legislation as well, their normal rate for telehealth visits. If we're successful with this, this means that uh, if we, and we get it done before July, this means we won't have that recoupment and all that craziness that we're gonna talk about in just a second. So um, this is something that we're trying to push for in phase four. Uh, I've spoken with Hill staff, um, and I believe we're going to introduce legislation that is a two-section legislation, very, very simple, maybe one to two pages, um, that is going to be introduced hopefully next week. 
and um, and it's something to point to, and we are trying to rally as much support behind it so that those provisions can be included in whatever the big phase four package is or some other package that emerges. And again, hopefully we would get this done before July 1, so uh, the recoupment uh, would not happen. Um, Again, we wanted to raise the cap to $92.03 because if we just paid RHCs their normal rate for a telehealth visit, I, we would be hurting all the independent RHCs because the independent RHCs actually do benefit from the telehealth payment being above the cap. So uh, that's why we wanted to make sure that at a minimum we're, we're keeping our independent RHCs whole and um, that, that their cap would be raised to $92.03. And that would be for all visits, not just telehealth. So um, when this legislation is introduced, again, hopefully next week, we will need the REC community to advocate for this and push this. It should be relatively simple to pay for or, or to explain to your legislators. Um, the The We'll have more uh, talking points uh, on our website when this does come out, but the easiest one to explain is I'm not getting paid my normal rate, uh, but CMS is paying me my normal rate currently, and they're going to ask to take all this money back in July, and that's ridiculous. At a time of a pandemic, you're going to ask me to owe money back to Medicare. Um, because they can't pay me my normal rate. So I think it's a relatively straightforward argument and um, hopefully we can, get it, we can get it done before July 1. And with that, that is the end of my presentation. So I'm gonna pull this up and, and, and toss it back to you, Mark. Okay, Nathan, thank you very much. That, that's, that sounds all very exciting. Hopefully we can get the get those changes that you talked about implemented and uh, start getting paid our, an increased reimbursement rate. That would be fantastic. Okay, now, okay, can everybody see my screen now? Anybody? Yep, I see it. Okay, got it, okay, thank you, Nathan. Okay, let's go ahead and get into the second section here of our presentations. Uh, again, my name is Mark Lynn, and this is the revised, again, the revised RHC Medicare tele, telehealth billing guidance for this week. Uh, stay tuned for next week's. And, um, and this has been so complicated, ever-changing laws, regulations, conflicting dates. Our first panelist question is, should drinking now be allowed on the job? Is anybody, anybody any comments on that one? I'll go ahead and take this one, Mark. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere. Yes, this is maddening. It really is. And, and uh, but don't, you know, don't shoot us the messengers. You know, we, we were dealt this hand of cards and we have to have to play those. Uh, I know, uh, I know Shannon got a little bit of flack yesterday from somebody that was upset about this. And, and I hear people all the time about how confusing it is. And if you look at the Facebook group, it's very funny about the memes and the people, people are getting very frustrated with this. So any other comments from our panelists there about the frustration with this? No comment. Okay, all right, we'll move on, we'll move on. Um, first thing we're gonna do is a view from 30,000 feet. This is gonna be stuff that I know very, very little about, but just stuff that I thought we have a lot of provider-based RHCs in here that would really, they've been asking for it. If you ever um, listen to those office hour sessions, they're five o'clock to six o'clock every Tuesday and Thursday, and it's a place for you to guys to ask questions. You gotta get in really early, and and hit star one almost as soon as you get into that session in order to ask a question or you're gonna get left out. But I noticed there was something, something was going on yesterday because I got an email from Lana Dennis early in the afternoon saying there's gonna be no office hours this afternoon. And that that led me something, something big was about to happen. And sure enough, um, CMS announced that afternoon the second round of sweeping changes for the healthcare system. And so definitely review that document there. It's pretty relatively long. There's a lot of information in there. It relates to hospitals, policy, and telehealth. There is the 
the uh, the link that you can link into that and, and read that document if you've not seen it already. Uh, some of the things it talked about was raising the telephone uh, service visits for, on the Medicare Part B fee schedule to raising them from about $14 to $41 up to $46 to $110. That's on the Part B side. We also had the thing on our RHC side where we can actually do telephone uh, visits as well. They added some piece in there where they can actually change regulations much faster than they did before. And I was having a hard time swimming with the current as it was. So so things are gonna if things are gonna change any quicker. Uh, we're all gonna sink with regulations here. They sort of went back and recounted uh, something about the distant site regulations as an effective March the sixth, and that made me sort of worry what where that where they were headed with that. And you're gonna see this in a slide coming up just in a minute, and uh, why that was a little bit of a concern to me. Uh, the next item again they added was the what Nathan talked about was telephone visits now the CPT codes 99441 through 99443 can be paid at $92.03 that is fantastic for rural health clinics I know we've been working closely with uh, one of our uh, clients in West Virginia they're in southeastern West Virginia they got six RHCs and every time I go there my cell phone does not work in those mountains and it's absolutely stunning and beautiful i'd love to go there but don't think about getting audio and visual telephone service in that area it's just not going to happen so that's really a benefit to them uh, they have thousands and thousands of, of telehealth video of telehealth telephone visits that they can bill now so that helps them for our hospital, Brock Slabach, i've known brock since uh, he was administrator in centerville field community hospital we set up a RHC for him 30 years ago. And so Brock is now with the National Rural Health Association. And from listening to those office hour sessions, everybody was in the hospital business was upset because on telehealth, they were missing out on the originating site uh, money uh, for that. And this piece of reg regulation allows now hospitals to, to get some originating site. It actually says that you can, you can designate somebody's home as a temporary provider-based department of a hospital. So Julie, your, your home now can be a provider-based department of a hospital. I have no idea what that means or anything like that. You can see it's in purple, so panelists, do y'all have any comments or any help uh, with that? And now and we have Kate Hill, who's with the compliance team and is uh, it's on the board of NARHC and she's fantastic and very helpful. And so, Kate, if you know anything about it, if, if anybody knows anything about this, please speak up because I just told well, you everything I know. This is this is Charles, and yeah. I don't have anything about this in particular uh, about the hospital piece of this, other than let's before we get into the nuts and bolts, and I mm -hmm. I'll keep my comments short. That back to my a second ago, no comment. <laughs> Relic. And, and I have to be a little bit careful when I say this. So Charles James, only as Charles James, but I think part of what we have been through is indicative of maybe where rural health clinics are on the priority list. Let's just be candid. And I think that it's indicative that often rural health clinics get left out of policy considerations and I think it's also indicative that honestly, there's there's a little bit of a predisposition on policymakers against really cost-based reimbursement. And and so I, I think that's part of what we suffer from on the rural health clinic side. And I think a lot of that is due to uh, just a lot of misunderstanding about rural health clinics and that it is more expensive for us to provide care in rural areas. And a lot of our transportation security that we experience with our Medicare beneficiaries will, will this will enhance our ability to treat those patients. So back to Nathan's comments about the policy initiative that we really need to make next week, it is just imperative that our legislators understand the difference and that cost-based reimbursement isn't all bad and here's who we are and what we are. And let's give one more plug to Elizabeth Ellis, a little tiny outpost rural health clinic that is going to be on 60 Minutes this Sunday. 
So please, everyone, watch 60 Minutes this Sunday for Elizabeth Ellis. Uh, she is uh, physically uh, not a, a large person. She's she's small but mighty, I say. So please watch that, and I, I will. That's my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charles. Anybody else want to tackle this before we move on? Yeah, I'm, I think that part of this is that we have to remember that anywhere that the provider is is allowed if they're at home um, they can provide that so while trying to read cms language sometimes is you know not that fun um, i think sometimes we have to remember that those hospital providers whether it's physical therapists or whatever anytime that they're doing telehealth and they're at home i think that's going to be caught up in some of this regulation right here that, that helps that helps me to to understand that thank you shannon okay all right, people, I'm, we're going to move on then and uh, go on to get into the RHC stuff. Well, almost to the RHC stuff. One thing uh, from that, that document yesterday, at the very end of it, there was a nice, beautiful two tables there that talked about where COVID-19 uh, testing could be done, doctors, hospital, doctors' offices, hospitals, uh, homes, nursing, nursing homes, pharmacy, drive-through testing areas, and it gave some rates uh, to be paid. Uh, for that. And it looks like this one last item here, lab specimen collection from a patient from listening. Again, listen to office hours. You can really should listen to those. You will learn a lot about healthcare things I didn't really know uh, that on there was that they were saying that hospitals were not able to get paid a collection fee for COVID-19, which I thought was crazy. They have to use PPE. They have to, they have the risk of catching it and they were not able to get paid for that, and according to this new document, now they can get paid this twenty-three to twenty-five dollars. So, so panelists, y'all got anything on that? Because, because uh, I just told you everything I know. I would add that um, United Healthcare just released information out that they are also going to waive um, cost sharing for any of their members for the antibody test um, that was released this morning. Um, so that's just something in addition um, that they're going to waive that, so providers should see full payment for that. Okay. All right. So, so uh, anybody else have anything before we move on? Okay. All right. Those are things that are sort of off topic from real health things, but I thought they were important things that changed in the whole healthcare system. And here's one last one. A lot of administrators were worried if COVID-19 strikes their community and they went above uh, 50 beds or more, they would lose their cost, their exemption from that horrible $86.31, piggybacking off of what Charles said, is $86.31 is not cost-based reimbursement. It is a fee schedule. Let me, that for all practical purposes, we do 175 cost reports every year, and we may have one independent RHC, so the cost per visit is not above $86.31. Uh, per visit. So we are not paid cost-based reimbursements with independent RCs. We're paid basically a fee for service for that. And we're only 1.8% of all physician practices in the country. So that is one reason why we are swept aside and sort of on the bottom of the barrel as far as uh, reimbursement goes. But for those administrators that are worried about about if they went up 50, 50 beds or more during COVID, during the, the PHE, they do not have to worry about that. It's, but they're going to use the number of available beds before they went into the PHE. So, so anybody have any comment on that before we move on and get into the real stuff that you're here for? Okay, we're good to go. We're going to move on. Uh, on that. Mark, so I, yes, I, go ahead. I do have one comment real quick. Oh, Nathan, okay. So I'm a big basketball fan, and and um, Masai Ujiri is the GM of the Toronto Raptors, and people were credit or were the media kept um, per perpetuating the uh, this notion that Toronto, no one wants to play for Toronto. Well, Toronto is the, uh, the reigning world champions, right? Um, and the analogy to here and and what. He told the media at the before that season. He said, um, "We need to we need to, to stop this narrative. People do want to play for Toronto." And he pushed back strongly against this "woe is me" attitude that folks the the local media in Toronto had. And so I do want to push back a little bit on this attitude that rural health clinics are always the last in line. Um, we need to push
push the narrative that we are important. We are getting attention. Um, it's useful in a certain sense that, hey, you aren't giving us enough, enough attention, but we we can't play this victim card all the time. And we do have to recognize that the government is doing uh, significant things for rural health clinics, perhaps not as much as we want, but there's this balance here that we have to that Fair we enough. have to achieve. Fair yeah. enough. Acknowledged. Yeah. And, and I must say, the things that CMS have done during this this PhD, I, you know, I've, I've been in healthcare for 40 years. I, I've never seen the amount of work and the effort that these guys have put in there. They're, they're like us. They're not perfect. Sure, some, sometimes right. they have missteps, but oh my goodness, what an effort they've made to help us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just, yeah. if I could just summarize that, it's it's more our efforts are will not be futile. Uh, we have not been completely ignored. We have been able to make positive changes. So efforts are not futile because we are just never thought of. We are thought of, perhaps not as much as we should, but our efforts to change policy are not futile. In okay, all right. Let's let's move on. I, th I think Mark. I'm Mark, yes, this is Kate. Mark, let me okay, just say one thing. I just. So when you were taught, I stepped away and got caught on that one, didn't I? But let me just say this about location. For telehealth, location is wide open. The location changes that were mentioned on the last uh, go round are not meant to open a rural health clinic in the middle of downtown, downtown Chicago. They are meant with the intent, if your clinic is in the hospital building and you have COVID-19 patients, you want to put, you want to move that clinic three blocks away or over to the MOB. That's fine. That's what they're saying. Or you want to split your clinic, keep half of it here for healthy, otherwise healthy, and over there for symptomatic. Or you want to see patients in the parking lot. That was the intent of that, not to start opening clinics in non-rural areas. Now, if that little piece of your clinic happens to fall out of a hip set, then it's fine. It's still covered. But we're, I'm getting calls like, oh, we're going to open a clinic over here. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. It's not meant for that. The purpose of it is to keep patients safe, and you have to do what you have to do to do that. I think it's important. Thank you very much, Kate. That's an excellent point. I think it's also important that we, in our push, make sure that we have a good explanation on why we should be paid our encounter rate for a telehealth visit. And so I think that's uh, that's something important that we have an answer for. Okay, let's get moving on here because I'm gonna I'm gonna wheel into some pe other people's time here. So so here's what the, the yesterday there was a release of a document. It was called the uh, SE two zero zero one six. It is a revised edition. It was the first edition came out on April the seventeenth, and then thirteen days later. Uh, come, out comes the new new edition of it. Here's what it looks like, and there is the website where you can go to and read it. It's only seven pages long. It was four pages before, and now it's up to, to uh, seven pages, and there is the information in yellow there that talks about what has changed. It put the information in red, so I'm going to screenshot some of these some of the pages that, that are in there. So, so we'll get to that just in one second. One of the things that we ran into was uh, all this backdating. Uh, let's watch for examples here. For, for example, RHCs can build telehealth visits starting January 27, 2022, months before the CARES Act was approved on March the 27th. That seems sort of strange to me, but okay, good. And then it also, uh, distance site, RHCs were allowed to be uh, that allowed to be distant site providers. That was that was that rule. And then 39 days before patient homes were allowed to be originating sites. That only came on March the 6th. And so there's some there's some big differences. There is a patient home can only be an originating site starting March the 6th, but but an RHC can go back and bill to January 27th. Uh, I'm not sure about that. So those are some of the issues there. We'll talk about that as far as with our panelists here. Here's the screenshot of the information that was in yesterday's um, uh, it revised SE20016. And my question is, okay, we can, it tells us the law on CARES Act says we can go back to January 27th, but there's another piece of legislation or regulation that says that we can only go back to March 6th and have the home being a 
being a um, originating site for a telehealth visit. So my question is the panelist is, can we really go back to January 27th or for all practical purposes, are we stuck going back to March the 6th as a distant site? Does, so does anybody, Nathan or Charles or anybody have any comments on that? I think we're all a little hesitant to say, hey, if you were doing it in January and February before we were under an emergency, then you weren't really following the RHC guidelines at that point. Um, what the federal rules and regulations were. There is where, you know, it was signed on originally March 27th, and then I did see the information back to March 6th, but I think I would probably have to, to send that one over to Nathan. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, um, we don't we don't know for sure um, what would happen if you build a claim from, let's say, January 27th and build it, let's say, G2025. Um, hopefully, I, I kind of think it's a moot point because probably that service wasn't happening on January 27th. So I don't, and and so hopefully it's not really a big issue. But um, yeah, we don't really have clarity on on what that what the backdating on this aspect means exactly, um, but hopefully, hopefully it, it, you don't have many claims that are in this category. Yeah. Yeah, I, would, you know, I wouldn't, go ahead. No, uh, Mark, please, after you. No, I was just gonna say, yeah, I was thinking from a practical standpoint is March 6th would probably be the, the first date if you actually just implemented it immediately as soon as you saw that, that would be the, from a practical standpoint, the first date you would be seeing claims going, going back that far. Uh, Charles, go ahead. Well, I think we're going to have a couple different problems. So first of all, we've seen where we've billed a lot of our telephone only visits as virtual check-ins. Yeah. And we've had people do that. So what are we going to do with those? In my view, I think there's room to, I, everyone's going to have to have a conversation with their max. There's probably room to pay those back and then reprocess them back to March 6th as this G2025. That's probably a question for our max, but we're gonna have a question about virtual check-ins that were telephone only visits. And I think this gives us the latitude to do that. I think that other people, the other issue people have been having is that our max have been having some trouble with the virtual check-in codes with the CG modifier and uh, over the past, uh, over the course of the past 10 days or so, those have been worked out, and either the MAC is going to go back and reap. Now, this is only for erroneously bounced virtual check-ins, but the MAC would go back and reprocess those and pay those correctly. Or, if anyone speaks this language, DDE, you could F9 those claims and kind of get a return to provider claim sent back in. But then that brings me to the last point. Some of the MACs have been out front on this G2025 issue prior to the CMS announcement. So I think part of us, we're gonna have to pay close attention to the particulars that our MACs give us. You know, Noridian could call for something marginally different maybe than NGS, who could call for something a little different maybe than Novitas. And, and I think that the Max probably have, you know, that's that's their prerogative, as I understand it. They can have their own payment rules. So, so I think we need to be cognizant of those things. The virtual check-ins that we're going to need to really probably send in a corrected claim in some manner for those that were telephone-only visits, those that were processed incorrectly by the max that were virtual check-ins and will be reprocessed automatically we're going to have just some reprocessing of claims all over the place on in this whole process i'm afraid so that's what yeah. the point i wanted to make yeah that charles and, and that i think that's going to come up in one of our slides uh in just in a few few minutes here too so we we'll, we will talk about that exact issue was when we get to the telephone services there because we we coded a lot of people were coding the g0071 
that were they were really nine nine four four ones or nine nine four four twos, and they were coded, they were billing them, and now they're like, oh no, I don't want to do that. I want to go back and I want the ninety two dollars and three cents. Forget this twenty four dollars seventy six cents. So what, there's there's going to be some issues there. So let's let's talk about let's get the out with the old in with the new. And so our April seventeenth guidance guidance told us for Medicare telehealth claims from January twenty seventh through June thirtieth two thousand twenty. Here was our process is on our in field locator 44 of the UBO4, we put a listing. There was 191 telehealth codes that, that are, are CPT codes that you could bill as a telehealth visit. The things like 99213s, 9924s, um, your G0438, G0439, those were all in there. And so we were using that. And they also, CMS told us you need to put the CG modifier and the 95 modifier on there. Those were two mandatory modifiers in order for you to get paid and your payment rate was gonna be $92. You were gonna get paid your all-inclusive rate. So if you were an independent RHC, you're gonna get $86.31 will be paid at your rate. Or if you were a provider-based and the mean average was $214, you were gonna get that. And your payments would be reprocessed in July to to sort of normalize those to this ninety two dollar rate. So if you're an independent RHC, you're going to get about five dollars extra in July per per telehealth visit. And if you're a provider based RHC, they were going to whack you almost a hundred bucks uh, if you're if you're if you had the average um, the mean. Um, all-inclusive rate for a provider-based RHC. And it, and it would all depend on what your actual interim reimbursement rate was from your MAC as far as being provider-based. So, so, so that was April 17th. That was the old. Now the new, the new guidance that came out April 30th, it was very confusing because the MACs did get this information a couple couple days ahead of time and started telling people. And uh, we were all complaining like, oh, they, they don't know what they're doing. They, why are they saying that? And then sure enough, this was announced yesterday that, oh, okay, they were just uh, ahead of the game. So so the CPT code now that you use, if and there's they've expanded that telehealth listing now to it's a little bit over 200 and something something telehealth codes that are out there. It's been expanded, but you're gonna use the G2025. So any of those 200 and something HixPix codes, you're gonna use G2025. You are definitely gonna to have to use the, modif the CG modifier until uh, June 30th. If you want to use the 95 modifier, if it works for, you, for your cost reporting or it works for your internal systems of you wanting to know what were telehealth visits, then, that's perfectly fine to use it. It's not supposed to reject your claim there, but your requirement is to do the CG modifier. Um, if you do have a, and there's another modifier we'll talk about in a minute called a CS modifier. If you want to add that, that's a cost sharing uh, modifier that will, that will uh, if it's related to COVID-19, then it will allow you to, to not collect that copay from the patient and you will get your full all-inclusive rate. Or, you're the, or the full ninety-two dollars and three cents from Medicare for this telehealth visit. Notice the the rate change from ninety-two dollars to ninety-two dollars and three cents. So they had a little math error on the first the first one. Things will still be pay, paid at the all-inclusive rate, and they will still be re reprocessed from this April thirtieth thirtieth uh, guidance. So, so for our, we have a couple of panelist questions here. Number one. Uh, is it still a good idea to keep that 95 modifier on there? Do you think it would help you maybe identify things on the cost report? That might be a Julie Quinn question there, or just better just to leave it off. Does it, do any panelists have any questions, uh, any comments on that? I would put it on to track it. You know, I, if, if we're having a question of tracking, I, I think with this, we have a big question about how we're gonna internally report our HICPIC codes, like you already said, Mark. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I haven't discussed it yet with our billing staff uh, and our billing team, but can't hurt for tracking. Okay. One of the things, Mark, that we- Yeah, go ahead, Doug. I see, I see you open up your line, Doug, go ahead. This one has come up a lot with us, with a, it's a billing service we bill for a lot of independent uh, provider-based RHCs. And what we've been asking our providers to do, we've been creating a separate location 
in the definitions and naming it the telehealth location uh, and then putting all the telehealth visits on that so that way when you're running your reports it's easier to carve out those visits uh, the trick is just <clears throat> remembering to use that location but i think it's it was easier for us to do that than to try to remember the 95 modifier Oh, excellent, excellent. So, so if you have Azalea, then they have a built-in system to handle handle it one way that whether you use a ninety-five modifier or not, that would that will work for you. And Julie, I see your line is your 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 uh, telephone is open. So go ahead and make your. I, I did uh, I did unmute myself. I and everyone that knows me knows I'm just dangerous when it comes to the billing side. I look to these experts when it comes to how the billing information is going to come off uh, for us to use for cost reporting but as we get into the carve outs for cost report we're going to have to come up with some mechanism whether it's purely seeing how many g2025s you did and then we can drill from there but yes we're going to have to be able to say we did this many telehealth visits and then if we can drill further and say this many were level two level three that would be great i'm just not sure that every system is going to have that capability yeah. and addition, I think that, so in addition i would say that if your system if your ehr you can keep it as a 99212 213 whichever um, and then at the clearinghouse level, you can write a custom rule to get that to switch over to the G2025. You're going to be able to write clear billing or run report. Um, how Azalea is doing it is fantastic. You're going to be able to run that by location. I think that's awesome. I think the thing that worries me that no one's brought up yet is if I do an annual wellness visit um, by telehealth now, you know, normally we can go into DDE and we can see when that patient mm -hmm. had their last telehealth or last annual wellness visit none of that information is going to populate on the common working file with all of these screenings um, that we're doing um, by telehealth so that's something else you're going to kind of want to think through is you know claims are going to be a little wonky let us get through this next year you know when you go to bill um, for your annual wellness and hopefully we're all back in the office of course by then it is going to be a little bit different. None of that screening stuff is going to show up on the common working file. So, Patty Charles, I don't know if you have other things or Doug, it's part of that. That's just a concern that I have is how do we track that? Oh, oh that's valid. That's, that's, you know, that's very why valid. I'm a, always a big fan. I, I liked when we got the new billing rule for rural health clinics, even though the qualifying visit is awkward that we have to include our detail on the claims because we just we have to have some way to track it. Uh, that's a valid reason. I don't know that trick. I don't know how you're gonna get the annual wellness visit on the common working file under this. So that's a mechanic we're gonna have to work at in the future. But um, definitely, I say, however you can retain that actual detail on your system, but not submit it with the claim, you're gonna be better off. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a good point, Charles and, and Shannon and everybody is excellent. I, I didn't even think about the uh, the common working file not being accurate with the, this G two hundred two five. So that's that's excellent. I would definitely want to make sure if it was me, I'd probably put the mo ninety five modifier, even if they do get scrubbed in the in the clearinghouse when they send them out. That, that way, you do have that information that Julie and I will need to prepare that cost report because we're going to figure out the time that you guys spent doing a G2025 unless we drill down to that Hicks code we're not going to know if you spent 11 minutes 20 minutes or 30 minutes of provider time uh, for whatever that G2025 telephone visit was and that's going to that's going to make a difference on how much time we end up disallowing on the cost report so let's move down to the, the next question and and because i'm sure we'll have some people commenting about this one this just came in this morning saying that palmetto isn't recognizing the new g2025 code when will the max uh, update their systems for the new cms guidance uh, and concerning the previous telehealth telehealth guidance or telehealth claims build uh, will those be reprocessed in accordance with the new g2025 guidance and so I'm like, Julie, I know enough about billing to be almost dangerous. And so Doug or 
for uh, Charles or any of you folks that deal with billing all the time? Do you have any comments on, on this particular panel's question? So I actually reached out to Palmetto. Um, you know, their main headquarters is located about 15 minutes from where I live. Um, so I like, I won't go show up there. Done it before. Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, we need some clarification. We need to know when their system is going to be modified. Um, we've got some great contacts. I'm sure um, Nathan and Bill are also probably on that as well. I promise as soon as I get it, I'll share it um, with you. I've not seen anything. I asked questions specifically about reprocessing the claims versus us having to do claim adjustments if we filed a 99213 with the CG in 95. You know, per the prior information, how's that going to be handled? Um, I also asked them to clarify if we had previously done a telephone call, how is that going to be handled as well? I just have not received. I sent that off yesterday afternoon late once I started seeing pretty quickly, um, and then one of the clinics that I work with um, notified me about the, it's not processing as well. So, unfortunately, I don't have any other updates at this point with, with Palmetto. Yeah, well, Shannon, thank you. Thank you for that. And and I would think that, that it, it this got it's only been out one day. So, uh, sounds like it's time for another webinar. Oh boy, <laughs> whenever, whenever we get the final guidance on exactly what to do. Uh, Doug, I, what, Doug, do you have something to say? I, you, your line was open there for a second. Do you, do, you, do you have any comments? No, I just think it's funny that we were talking earlier, the fact that they came back so quickly and said, never mind, we want you to use the G code, told me, okay, well, maybe they figured out how to get it in their system. But no, if it's not ready to pro like what's going on? Like why do they how do they I figure they needed to buy themselves time to get the code loaded so they could pay it and that's why they said July first and then maybe they turn around and figure out it was easier than they thought and said, All right, now we want you to use the G code, but then now we're not sure if they're gonna be able to process it. I just found yeah, that funny. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the same thing. I was like, wait a minute. I thought it had to be July 1st before to get this thing loaded. And now all of a sudden magically it works. I, and their story didn't sort of sort of fit there as well. Uh, Nathan, I see your line is open. Did you, did you have something to say too, or did you just, just leave it open? Sorry, I just muted on my phone. That's why my line's open. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, uh, never mind. Okay, gotcha. But all right. we don't have anything else. Other right. than I'll say that this is another reason why I would like this to change. I would like to be able to bill 99214 with just a modifier, get paid the all-inclusive rate, count it as a visit, count the cost on the cost report. That is the vision that I see long term. And I do not want the policy as, it's, as it is currently to be the policy that gets locked in place forevermore. So just these are all reasons why we need to get it changed. Okay, perfect. All right, let's... Let's move on. Here is just a screenshot of what was in the uh, in the document that was sent out yesterday. You see, everything in red is the items that changed. They're putting they're setting the rate to ninety two dollars and three cents. They're using the revenue code is going to be a five two x if it's in the uh, if it was some, a telehealth visit that's normally in the office. That's going to be a five two one. If it's in a nursing home, it could be either a zero five two four or a zero five two five. If it's in an assisted living facility, that would have meant a revenue code zero five two two. So so those would be the revenue code you'd use. There's your HixPix code. That's going to go in field locator forty four under UBO four the G two o two five and then again. The CG is required, the 85 is optional. So that's just the source document where I generated that slide of the, the previous slide. And then, uh, and then here's what your claim form is gonna look like. Uh, UBO4, the ANSI 837, you're gonna build these on the UBO4. You're gonna use a bill type 0711. That's basically you're asking Medicare to pay, you have a, a payable visit and they want you to pay it. There's your revenue code we just talked about. Here's your HixPix code. And here's the summary, the CG modifier. Uh, possibly you could put the CS modifier on there if it's related to a COVID patient. And then the 95 is not required. Um, what, and what they told us was that the, the reason why you had to use the CG modifier until June the 30th was CMS was not gonna update their system until July the 1st. And that's why you have to put the CG modifier. They are gonna pay you at your all-inclusive rate until uh, June the 30th. A lot of people ask us, oh, what's the place of service code, for place of service on the UBO4? There is no place of service. It's this revenue code tells CMS where, where everything is gonna be, be done. And 
The panel must uh, input, will RHCs have to append or refile their claims already processed? I think Shannon's done a great job already explaining that we don't know yet. She's, it's 15 miles away. She's gonna run down to Palmetto and we'll get an answer sometime next week and she's gonna share it with us on how to re uh, append or refile these claims. But that's something that's on our to-do list uh, right now. Uh, does anybody have any any panelists have any questions or comments about this particular uh, slide here before we move on? No, I just want video of Shannon running. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that'll be good. If if Shannon is running, there's somebody after. Uh, that that would be me right there. So, mm -hmm. so, so no, okay. she's no, she's been running after bocce balls after. in her yard. She's that's after. true too. That's true too. Okay, so let's let's move on to uh, after. Okay, so that's the the guys we just told you about got us through June the thirtieth. Thankfully, July first is going to be a little bit simpler. Nothing really changed there. Our guidance from April seventeenth said we're going to do, do six, use G two O two five in field locator forty four on the UBO four. We don't have to put any modifiers on there. Our rate's gonna be $92, and we're not gonna have to reprocess the claims. Very, very simple process. April 30th comes about, and everything is exactly the same, except for, woo, we get a three cent raise. So it's gonna be $92.03 versus $92. That is the only change affecting your claims um, uh, after that. So here's the re revised information. And this is the same information that we gave you uh, when we did this this webinar on April the 22nd. So there is no 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 changes there. Uh, if you want to add the 95 modifier, it's not going to reject on you if you add that to it as well. So I think we should be pretty good on that one. That one said so nothing really changed on that. So uh, Question again: Do we do we know what will happen to claims already submitted? That, that that was a common question in the RHC information group today. So I copied and pasted it several times. Uh, the, the answer to that is we don't know. Uh, the answer to that whether it have to be appended F9 or Sam learning stuff all, all the time with these things. So so thank you, Charles. So we will have to do something. We just don't know what it is. And and all these people are very good about communicating uh, with you on what will happen. So so we will worry about that. We do have, um, and I'm gonna have to pick up my, my speed here. Uh, here Here's some information from the revised. What I did was I'm, I had some T accounts and showed you how the billing would work. So let's do it real quickly. Here's our assumptions. We're, we're gonna charge $100 for a 99213. Uh, the all-inclusive rate for an independent RHC is $86.31. For a provider based, we use the average of rate from Wifley does these great benchmarking reports. So last one I saw had an average of $214 per visit, cost per visit. So I'm gonna use that. Whether you're independent or provider based, you're gonna have the same telehealth payment rate, $92.03. And, and what Nathan was saying for independent RHCs, we're like, yay, we get the telehealth rate. That's $6 more than we normally would have get. And provider based RHCs are going boo. We get this, this is $97.57 less than what we normally get for a telehealth visit. So, so we can see how that policy is not sustainable in the long run. So the copay, $20 is 20% of 100. That's what we're gonna collect uh, from the patient unless it's related to COVID and then you use the CS modifier. And uh, let's go over here to what happens. The settlement calculation, is we're gonna use $69.05 as our payment from Medicare, because remember, you only get 80% from 80% of your rate from Medicare, and there's no sequestration during the PHE. So that 2% that they used to take out, that no longer applies for now. Now that's gonna come back after the PHE is over, but for now you will get 80% of your rate. So that's that's why it looks you get a few more dollars every visit. If you're provider based, that you're going to get $171.20 per visit based on 214. And as an independent RAC, you'll get $69.05 for every visit. That's again, that is woefully, woefully low. It's it's falling behind. Okay, so our telehealth payment rate, they're still only going to pay you 80% of that. So when I say you get $92.03, you're not getting $92.03. You're getting $73.63 per telehealth visit. 
no matter if you're provider-based or independent. And what will happen is when we, when, when CMS recoups this money in July, the typical, and again, I'm gonna say these are typical, these are not exact numbers, but, but a typical independent RHC is gonna get about $4.58 per telehealth visit back. And the typical provider-based RHC is gonna have a recoupment of $97.57. And what some provider-based RHCs have said, oh, that's gonna, that's gonna hurt when July comes around and they take all that money away from us, can we hold our claims until July 1st and then submit all the G2025s at one time? And that way we won't get reprocessed, the claims won't get reprocessed and the money taking away from us. And you certainly, that is allowable to do that. There's timely filing issues that you have from Medicare, but, but that's one year from date of service. So that shouldn't affect you any you may run into some timely filing issues on your secondary payer as well if you wait. And sometimes the secondary payers are very, very short timely filing issues. It could be three months, could be six months, it could be a year. So those are some of the issues you have. Panelists, do y'all wanna weigh in on whether provider-based REC should hold their claims until July 1st or just go ahead and, and build up a little bit of cash and then pay it whenever it's sort of like an interest-free loan. I mean, if it was me, I, was I would probably say, bill it and get, back, get and pay it back. But go ahead, Charles. I don't think a lot of our folks are going to be able to hold the claims. Yeah. I think for those that can do it, that's a great option. But a lot of them just that's not an option. It so of course for those more at-risk sites, it's going to be more difficult to maintain the balance when those get reprocessed back. So that would be the negative. I think of that. The the other issue though towards holding on to them, if you look in the guidance, it does it's it's not an exact equivalent, but on on our non-visit claims. So we're we have the ability to bill some non-visit what would otherwise not be visits, especially in FQHCs. Uh on the FQHC side, they've said exp expressly hold this volume of claims until July 1 and then build up. So if you can weather, if you can weather that. Uh, financially, it may not be a bad option. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have anything on that before we move on? Okay. All right. I'm going to move on here. And here's our little T accounts here. Here's what the re using the revised guidance. And I moved my date back to March 6th, just based on our conversation earlier. Uh, here's what our G code is going to look like the G2025. Now, this is from January, from March the 6th and through June the 30th, and we're an independent RHC. Here's our form, lo our field locator 44 G2025, and we're gonna add the CG modifier to that. We're gonna charge $100 uh, for it. Our all-inclusive rate's gonna be $86.31. And if you put this into our accounting system, we're gonna have a charge $100. We're gonna collect cash of $20 from the patient or their secondary insurance. Medicare is going to be nice enough to pay us $69.05, and we're going to write off $10.95 as a Medicare contractual adjustment. And then in July, when CMS comes in and our, Medi our MAC reprocesses the claims, we should have a receivable of about $4.58 per claim, and our cash receipts will come in uh, debit, and we're going to have a contractual adjustment of a, a, a a negative contractual adjustment of $4.58, which is great. That means we 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 reduce our contractual adjustment. So that was the, the things in red are the numbers that changed uh, on that particular slide. And then if you're provider-based, the same scenario, same uh, field locator information there. Uh, the difference will be this the $214 all-inclusive rate. If we only charged $100 for this charge, we actually would have what's called a negative contractual adjustment. We would receive more money than what we collected. That's always fun explaining to your patient, patients why you why you collected more money than you charged and you still want them to pay you $20, $20 uh, for that. And then of course, here's the, the bad news that we talked about the recoupment coming in in July and we've already had our panelist input on that particular one as well. So, um, uh, let's see here. Here's a telehealth visit. Um, let's see, established patient occurring July 1 through the end of PHE. And then this is what, this is after July the 1st. This is the simple thing that we don't have to put the CG modifier in our field locator 44. That's going to be G, 
2025 CMS, instead of paying us $92, they're going to pay us $92.03, and that's going to change our contractual adjustment and our payment just a little bit down here. But that's really going to be the only change from our last webinar that we had. This will be the big change in, in this webinar, the telephone visits here. And this is where we we copied from. This is the screenshot uh, from the um, uh, from the document that, we, that where they added these these um, uh, the telehealth codes, the telephone calls. I'll get this right in a minute. The telephone calls here. Here's if you click onto this document, which will be on the next page. That is that listing of 200 and something tele telehealth codes and they added 99441, 99442, 99443, audio only. And we can bill those now as a G2025. So Pamela's question is, um, what about claims already submitted? Can we be refiled, refilled, refiled, sorry about the typo, refiled as corrected claims to get more reimbursement? So could we cancel all those G0711 claims? and resubmit those as a G2025 and get moved from 2476 to $92.03. And so well, I guess I'll open it one more time and, and you guys can tell us, Charles, can you, can you help just, us on that? Just please point out, first of all, I don't wanna take all the air, somebody else can answer. The G0711 is, is, is not a thing. So, so we don't, to my knowledge, we don't have G0711 one claims unless I'm misspeaking. So, so G0511. G0071. Okay, I was, that, that's sorry what that. we're referring to. So that may have come in as as the question. And so yeah, that will yeah. So I just so G0071, that was what I was referring to a couple slides ago where where to me it would be acceptable to to repay our G00 Seven. Now I'm trying. I'm getting tongue tied on it. G0071 claims and have those resubmitted as uh, correct. I'll let the billing people go with the current code and corrected claims and 718s and 719s. But re yes, refile those as a telehealth visit. I would. I would think that would be perfectly acceptable. Uh, but it is G0071 that we would refile as G2025. Oh yeah. Copy and paste sometimes gets you in trouble, doesn't it? So mm -hmm. I, I apologize for that. I didn't notice the I didn't notice the difference in in that number there. But but yeah, what, I mean, if it was me, what I would do is uh, there's a bill type that you can use to cancel a claim. So if that claim is being held up, is cancel out all of those. I think it's what it's zero seven one seven or seven one eight. Right. There's a there's a bill type that you can put in there, cancel that claim, and then resubmit it the way with their guidance. Is that what you do, Charles? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. Let me just, could I just chime in? Real quick? Yeah, go ahead, Nathan. Um, it's important that you're only doing that for those claims that uh, were the audio only telephone uh, services. If you were billing G0071 because your provider had spent time going back and forth with the patient through the patient portal, those need to stay as G0071. So it's not a blanket statement. Oh, yeah. and, and, and keep in mind, that's an excellent point, Nathan. G0071, text, text counts, email portal counts. counts, portal. Thank you, Patty. Portal, yes. So keep that in mind. This So back when, and I and I retract, I don't want anyone to think I was disparaging anyone. All of the people that did heavy lifting on this, this is a great thing for us to be have these telephone visits so so uh, Shannon um, could you clarify would we adjust those claims or cancel those claims do you have a I didn't mean to put you on the spot no you're good I I would say that I think that I mean if you cancel the claim they're going to automatically pull the money back and then you're going to have to reprocess so even if you file like the corrected type of claim, to me, I would say canceling is going to make it nice and easy. They take their money back. We refile. But I was also going to make sure you're going to have to do something because CMS does not know if it was a text, if it was a uh, portal conversation back and forth, or if it was a phone call prior to the guidance they've released um, as of yesterday. So I think that's going to have to be a system process. But if it's me, I'd want to cancel the claim um, just so it comes back clean. 
Okay, perfect. Okay, let's let's move on then. I, I think that we sort of have a have a plan there, and we and we will get some more guidance in, in the in the in next week or so to let you guys know what to do with this. Here are the codes, the CPT codes: nine nine four four one through nine nine four four two. You can see the number of minutes: five to ten minutes, uh, eleven to twenty minutes, and twenty one to to 30 minutes. When you go over 30 minutes, then there's no more codes for you. For all practical purposes, for an RHC, once you hit five minutes of documented time, you're really hitting G2025 category. So you really are not getting compensated any more money uh, as you go, go as you go down this line. Of course, obviously, if the patient needs those services, you're going to do it. Make sure you timestamp your documentation. Uh, Patty will talk about that sort of information in her presentation next. But as you can see it's extremely important that you timestamp your information not only for Patty's sake as far as as far as the billing goes, uh, but for Julie and for myself on cost reporting as well, so we know how much time to to disallow uh, for that. So those are the Hicks Picks codes. Uh, also, these telephone visits have the same sort of look back that you have for a virtual visit. If it's related to uh, an established visit that occurred within seven days, you're not going to be able to build this telephone visit. Or if you have a telephone visit with the patient and you basically tell them, okay, come in at the next available appointment or within 24 hours, you're not going to be able to build that telephone visit. Um, as well. So keep that in mind. Yes, hey, Mark, can I, yes. can I chime in? I, I got it from a very reliable source that we're better to adjust than cancel. Just thought I'd throw okay. that in there. Okay. Adjust versus cancel. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Let's move on then to the, the next one. Here is the listing of the telehealth services. So if you click into this document here, you're going to get a Excel spreadsheet and that Excel spreadsheet is going to look just like this. So they added this extra column over here where it says, can audio only interaction meet the requirements? So the answer is yes, yes, yes for a lot of these. That's why I this thing about Medicare payment limitations and non-covered service. So that sort of confused me. So our of our panelists knows exactly why they would add a non-covered service on here. Let us know. And, uh, but, uh, but this important here is they added a lot of yeses for telephone only for you guys. And they added the G0438 and 439. Those can be done as audio only as well. Again, we have the same issue that we have with other, with uh, with this before is how, even with video is how do you take vital signs? How do you document? So panelists, do y'all have any sort of comments or questions about this particular document that came out that I'm, that I'm not uh, expressing? Just to check it regularly, they change it. A lot, just like everything else. <laughs> yeah, keep adding to it. Good, but you, you know, we talk about refiling or adjusting and correcting claims. So every time they add stuff on here that could have been um, filled, you know, you, you just want to be ahead of it because we've been flagging our system to identify, you know, what what, what can be billed, what cannot be billed. as telehealth, educating our providers. So the more you know it, the more you can educate, and then. When you're going through your scheduling process, you can be more aware of what can or cannot be done as a telehealth now and incorporate that into the scheduling process. You just got to check it constantly. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably a good idea to take this Excel spreadsheet and print it off and give it to your providers so they can see what services they can do via tele telephone or telehealth and uh, and then work on your scheduling. Maybe have a staff meeting to go over. OK, what can we do? Well, we can do you know, our G0438s via telephone uh, now during this pandemic so we can so we can do that. And do remember, I didn't notice the status on here. I didn't mention that. But a lot of these will go away. There's about 85 codes on here that will go away once the PHE is over. So Doug makes a good point is we'll look at this this list quite often because not only will it expand during the PHE, but it will go away once the PHE is over. So you just can't use the same list for you know the next year and a half, it's not going to be it's not going to be accurate. So any, anybody else have anything before we move on? Mark, I, I, this is perhaps a technical distinction that's re not totally relevant, but I think might be relevant eventually, especially if we get our way on the um, on changing the telehealth uh, policy. But uh, I don't believe that all these other codes are not. I wouldn't consider them telephone only. If you're doing all these other codes, 
um, including, I would say, G0438 and 439, those are still technically audio-visual. The only ones that are audio-only are the 99441 through 3. And um, so, so it doesn't matter for RETs because we bill everything as G2025, um, which is one of the weird things about us. But technically, you're not doing um, these other services if it's audio only. Uh, you're doing the 9941, 441, 442, or 443. Um, does that distinct? Does that distinction make sense? Not to me, Nathan, because it says on here, it's in the line, see, the G0438 is in the column that says, can it be done telephone only? And it says, it says that it can be. I mean, I, I don't know. I have a hard time figuring out how you do an annual wellness exam, an annual wellness visit, um, telephone, uh, even doing telehealth. But according to this is you can have a telephone only. Does, does any of the other panelists have a comment about that? Because, I mean, they've really expanded the number of telephone only visits or uh, well, you, you have to remember that annual wellness visit is not necessarily hands on a patient mm -hmm. um you would do that as part of a normal visit where i'm checking your blood pressure i'm checking your temperature all of those things but it's developing their plan of care in a sense is what do you want to work on and what are your risks and all of that mm -hmm. i think something else um that someone else just pointed out to me as well is you know, when we're filing the annual wellness, you know, normally for those, because it's preventative, it's paid um, at 100%, no coinsurance. Um, so now I'm a little concerned because when we filed the G2025, is it going to process with coinsurance for an annual wellness visit? How, do, how are they going to know? That's a good point. Patty, Charles? No, that's a good point. And I'm still concerned about your earlier comment about how are those preventive services going to get on that patient's um, common working file? How are they going to get credit for having those services? And then the, the cost share is another issue. I, I think for those reasons, we can expect some more guidance as we refine this, I'm sure. And I think we'll just have to stay tuned to, to Doug's point. Okay. This is and sort of like yeah, watching. You're right. Watching. Mark. I, I guess I didn't see the um, the addition. To, I guess they did yesterday. There's a column can audio only. So I missed that. I'm sorry. You're right. So the those can be audio only now. Okay. Can you repeat that, Nathan? I, I didn't hear you the first time. What was that? You you were you were what? You were what? I just I, I do that to my wife occasionally. About once in 35 years of marriage, my wife has said, "You are right," and so <laughs> so I, I tease her. Right, about you're it. right, Mark. Yeah, sorry, oh, sorry, I missed you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's let's like I said, this is sort of like watching sausage being made. If you guys and we appreciate, it. we still have 400 of you guys still on the line here, so we apologize for me taking up way too much time. Uh, somebody asked this morning, so I'm just going to blow through these so Patty and everybody doesn't doesn't go away. Uh, we're assuming that counseling codes 90832 are not billable by telephone only. The answer is yes, they are. They're on the list there. It says, yes, you can. So look, check what Doug said makes a lot of sense. Check this list and check it often. And then uh, there is um, what will happen if, if you did a telephone, telephone only visit. Here's your code 99443. We're going to charge 100 bucks for it. It's going to code, and this is from um, March the 1st. Remember in the documents there that this telephone services can go back to March the 1st. So if you're going to append or refile or whatever you're going to do to correct these claims, you're going to go back and look at your telephone only uh, services, not your G0071s that were true virtual visits. But if you're really doing 99441 through 99443s, back to March the 1st, that's when this started. You can go back and scrub your claims and look at them and figure out which ones were really telephone visits that you were billing uh, as a G0071. And those are the ones that you want to refile or, re or, or append or whatever you have to do to get paid. So that's your, your data service will go back to 3-1-2020. And it's gonna get the same treatment as any G2025. You're gonna put the CG modifier on it up until uh, June the 30th. And then after July the 1st, 
it's going to work exactly the same way. In this case here, we had a, a 99441. We only charged $50 for it. We're still going to get the $92.03 for that. So let's move on here. The CS modifier is, you know, y'all know me, I hate the CS modifier, but it it was here's the screenshot of what was um what was in the um the document yesterday talks about how you can use it one of the questions that i always have about the cs modifier and let's go to it because i'm running out of out of time the reason why the cs modifier is great is because the patient does not have to pay you guys any additional uh copay for that and instead of getting that 69 dollars and five cents that you got before you're going to get a through your full rate the eighty six dollars and thirty one cents if you're a if you're an independent RHC. So, so if you can add the CS modifier and it's it's related to COVID, then that's something that you want to, that you want to do. Uh, here's just the who, when, what, and where of it and the reference on where to look that up. I guess we'll end my section of it with this is one last panelist question is. Um, and I, again, listen to this office hour sessions is you hear different things. Some of the CS, modif some people say the CS modifier is very narrow in scope that you have to have a certain ICD-10 code on there. But when you read the language, it says that if it's related to ruling out a COVID-19 test, that you can include that CS modifier. So for our panelists, what, what should our clinics be be doing on how should they use the CS modifier? Should they use with a broad stroke or should a very narrow stroke? Well, I was looking at, this is a little different, but have you guys seen the thing about uninsured um, COVID related claims getting paid at the same as the Medicare rate? Uh, it came out this week that part of that guideline they had a few diagnosis codes that they considered um, encounters for suspected <clears throat> coronavirus. And I was thinking that if you had a, that same set, and there was about five or six different ICD-10 codes, that that kind of is what qualifies it for something like that. And maybe also the usage of this CS modifier, you're kind of using a diagnosis code to show that you're doing something to treat either someone who has it or is suspected of it. Okay, and that makes sense. So, so it's a very you, you got five or six ICD-10 codes that you that if that patient has that, then those are eligible for the CS modifier. That's is that is that what you're saying, Doug? That's what I'm just. That's the way we're looking at it. Okay. So, Mark, I think there's some CDC guidance on which ICD-10 codes to use. Okay. I might could find the list here. <laughs> Yeah, if, yeah, Doug, if you want to send those to me or Patty, if you want to send those to us, we will definitely share those in the uh, group there so people will know when it's appropriate to use. I know on the office hour session, they're everybody, they read very broadly because they want to be able to use it. While CMS typically says, no, you can only do it for certain ones, which I think what Doug had said and what Patty are referring to as well. So, so let's go questions. Let's, that means it's time, Patty. I'm going to turn this thing over to you guys, to you right now, and make you the presenter. And I apologize for taking way too much time, but I think we, like I said, we were making a little bit of sausage there, and uh, I think some of that stuff was very helpful to people. So, Patty, go ahead and take over for us. We we appreciate it very much. Okay, I'm just going to hit some broad points, guys. These are some slides that you may have seen before, and we're not going to go over all of them. But I think m most of the questions have been about documentation requirements, particularly how to capture vital signs. And so I've added some slides um, to this presentation that, that may help with that. Um, so we want to document, we still want to document with telehealth services or virtual services. We still want as much clinical documentation as we can to support and uh, differentiate between the type of service and the level of service that we've done. And if you can work with your EHR, like, um, like with Azalea or, or with a Prima, if you can work with your EHR on those, you need to. If you don't have a module that you can be using right now, you need to be creative and come up with some documentations. Um, 
stop and start times are going to be important again for determining the level of the service and documenting the provider time whether or not your um, your EHR is going to be able to take those start and stop times or your paper note is going to be able to take those times and translate them to something that your cost report preparer can use that may be a whole nother issue um, and I'm just going to kind of skip ahead. It's very important that these records, especially if they're not tied in with your EHR, that you have really prompt completion of records, that we don't leave those things out there because the telehealth miss uh, telehealth visits and the virtual visits, we have less in our mind to, to tie us to those since we didn't actually physically interact with the patient. So I think it's important to be timely with that documentation. Uh, CMS doesn't have any particular guidelines. If you've been on the office hour calls, um, they get a lot of questions about documentation for phone calls for the preventive services. So what I'm going to show you are best practices. MGMA has these best practices for documenting a telehealth service and the link is at the bottom of the page. And then AHIMA, who is the, um, the health information management folks, they have a little bit lengthier um, documentation guidelines for telehealth. And so um, these are best practices, guidelines, they are not anything that have come to us from a regulatory um, uh, compliance standpoint or guidance standpoint. So um, um, most people agree that there needs to be a two-step process. So uh, the provider decides if a telemedicine or a virtual visit is appropriate and then that service is scheduled. And so it's between that time of it being determined that it's necessary and the scheduling that we might be able to obtain consent under general supervision. Um, and so it's usually a two-step process. Um, and then the, the provider is the one responsible for documenting their service. Um, and so this slide and the next slide are AHIMA's best practices. Um, so one thing that we've done on our paper note that I'm going to show you in a minute is we've added a few places to document some of these best practices, such as the location of the patient and the location of the provider. So we know that we don't have restrictions on that right now during the public health emergency, but when we're getting used to telemedicine and we know this is how we're going to go forward with things, we need to get in, uh, in the habit of documenting as accurately and as completely as we can. So again, we have MGMA best practices, we have AHIMA best practices. Those are just two examples for you to use. Uh, these handouts are over in the handout section of the webinar panel. Um, and those they also can be available to you if you reach out to, to us for those. Um, and here again, um, more of AHIMAs. So uh, MGMA was really short with two little paragraphs and AHIMA gave three, uh, three long recommendations. I have had health information management directors reach out to me and, and ask um, why not everything they're seeing goes by AHIMA's guidelines. Um, so just know if you get a question, it could be because those, um, those uh, health information professionals are expecting AHIMA's guidelines to be followed. Um, and there is a toolkit available for, from AHIMA and the link for that toolkit is at the bottom of this slide. So um, you guys have probably seen this before. We are offering this paper note um, free to anybody who wants it right now that may not have um, EHR capability right now. So these are the, some of the things we're gonna wanna capture, the patient information, we're gonna wanna capture the provider. Now that we have expanded provider tags in the rural health clinic, we may wanna capture what that provider's credential is. Is that a physical therapist? Is that a dietitian? Is that um, an LCSW? Is it, uh, um, is it an MD, a DO, a nurse practitioner? We may want to capture that. Um, also, we want to capture the patient's name, their date of birth, um, some patient identifiers. If we have a minor patient, the best practice is that the parent or the guardian be present during the telemedicine visit. So we um, have made it really easily where you just check that box. 
also you just uh, have check boxes for verbal consent obtained and for acknowledging that um, maybe a HIPAA uh, non-compliant HIPAA method was used. So we can document all that in the top part of our note along with the type of disservice that we've provided. Um, we've also modified, it, modified this note to um, actually list what application was used. Um, uh, that may be helpful when we're going back and deciding. And then we know with our telemedicine visits, we will have COVID visits, COVID related visits, but we will also have other visits, anything on that approved list that we've been talking about. So any other acute condition or chronic condition. Um, and then we have added on this note, the location of the patient and the location of the provider um, in accordance with AHEMA's guidelines for the documentation. So this might be the things that we want to capture, make sure our EHR is capturing, make sure that we are tracking the types of services by which providers, um, so that we have that data uh, when we come to having to carve some of this out. If we move along, we want to collect as much history of present illness as possible um, because we're going to be heavily reliant on the patient or the historian for most of this information since we will not have an actual physical exam. Um, so we have added a section to our note. Um, you can see I have a yellow box around it. It's vitals per patient or historian. Um, because we're just going to have to capture that information um, as history of present illness. And we might want to refer to that patient's medical record for their, their, um, their, what their past history has been on constitution and vital signs. Um, but we're going to have to rely heavily on the, the patient as the historian and the history that they give us. Um, as far as the annual wellness visit, if the patient weren't in the home, if the patient were in another originating site, we might have a, teleme a telemedicine presenter there that could actually take these vitals. But if this is a phone call only, the patient is in their home or they're in their home, we aren't going to have a way to objectively capture those vital signs. So it's going to have to be part of history. Uh, then we want to go on just like we do in our regular note to the, you know, if we were having a SOAP note, we would have an assessment and a plan section of that note. So we also want to include that. And then just for easy sake, we've made some um, check boxes for whether we had to order the COVID screening test, whether the patient was sent to the emergency room, uh, did, the, did our service with that patient uh, result in a prescription being ordered or a prescription being refilled. So we've just tried to capture everything. Now, if you have an EHR, you won't need this kind of paper note, but I think it also helps to visually see what some components of documentation would be. And so um, it, we will make this uh, paper note available to, to anybody who will um, message me on the Facebook pages or email me. We'll be glad to share that. And we have revised it. We started making this note like on March the 7th. And so this note has been revised three times, just like all of our other slides and our billing guidance have been updated over the time that we're doing it. Okay, I got this question yesterday three or four times. Just because we have G2025, G0071 is still a valid code. It was a valid code before COVID. It's going to be a valid code after, after COVID. It's not going away. So there are still services that we could be doing that we will be capturing and reporting with G0071. Um, and the reimbursement for that code um, during uh, the COVID emergency has been increased to 2476. Um, that reimbursement will revert back to about the $13 that we were getting before the emergency uh, when we're done with this. So this is the code that we would still use for certain e-check-ins, certain e-visits, uh, G2010, G2012, um, the 99421 through 99423 codes. So these are technology assisted services, um, digital e-services, um, such as what uh, Charles mentioned, secure text, patient portal, 
um, that brief e-check-in to see if the patient needs to come in, which would fall short of a regular uh, uh, telephone only evaluation man and management. So G007 is not going away. G0071 is not becoming another code. Um, what we see in the guidance that we got yesterday though is the telephone call codes um, that we were assuming went under the G0071 umbrella are now moved over to that other side under the G2025. So we still have virtual communication services. Um, you still may want a way to track these services or track claims on hold or tracks cl track claims that you've adjusted. Um, so you can simply do that with um, a spreadsheet type tracking if you're not able to do that within your system. Um, we do know this is old news. This has not changed that if we're using um, a communication method that is not HIPAA compliant, that the um, OCR is going to turn a blind eye to enforcing those violations. They're not waiving them. They're just um, not going to enforce them. So there again, make sure on that note that you make sure that the patient uh, is aware of whether you're using a, a HIPAA compliant method of communication or not. Um, and same thing we've talked about before, we can use FaceTime, we can use um, Messenger, but we can't use anything that's publicly facing like FaceTime Live or, uh, or any of those things that would be broadcast to the whole world uh, that are public facing. Okay, and these are the compliant, uh, uh, HIPAA compliant uh, communication products, platforms. Um, I just want to say during telemedicine, um, we're getting used to this, during a public health emergency in very small towns or rural clinics, it's very easy for us to say, oh my goodness, Mrs. Jones came in today and her test was positive. Um, so we need to make sure that the need to know rule still applies during a public health emergency. The only time that we can disclose things are when we're disclosing these cases to public health agencies and to other uh, agencies and law enforcement agencies if there is um, a, a risk of harm to people. And then we need to be concerned about the security of our computers at home with everybody working from home. And so uh, we're gonna have PHI up on our computer screens as we're working. We wanna make sure that we, we don't leave those screens up. We don't have unauthorized access from people while we're all working at home. Um, I think we talked about this last time and this hasn't changed. I think this is something that Kate Hill's been really good about reminding us of, that we are all in a live emergency plan activation. Um, and so you need to be keeping up with what you're doing because what we did on March 7th is not the same thing that we were doing on March 15th is not the same thing that we were doing on March 20th. So this has been a progressive response where normally our emergency plan response is just a, a very small window of hours or days. Um, we're in into week eight or nine now. And so another thing that we have um, prepared is an emergency plan activation document to help people document what they've done. And uh, we also would make that available to you if you would like that. Um, you just let me know your name, your facility name um, and your location and we will get any of our um, Inquidox library items out to you um, uh, to use during this time. And you've already seen that picture, so I am ready to give it back. I'm gonna give it to Julie, is that right? That's right. Okay, uh, change presenters to Julie. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you, Patty. Okay. So now you see my screen, but I can't see you guys. So if I do this, can you still see my screen or do you see all four? We see your screen and we see all four. So, so we're good to go. Oh, nice. Okay. So I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth just so that I can be sure that I'm not, you know, showing you the window behind me with all of the, the glare or anything like that. But basically what I want to do here today, because we are 
way, I know way over time. So these are a lot of the same slides we went over before. If you did not listen to it the first time around, what I'd like for you to do is go listen to it on the recording. I'm not gonna go through this piece again, again, in its simplest form, RHC cost divided by visits equals its rate. We have to put the telehealth down in the bottom and that non RHC, it allocates overhead. Again, those elements we're not gonna go through today. We don't have time for that today, but we went through those in detail and they will be on the recording. Mark, is that recording available, I guess, online? Absolutely. We, we, everything is on ruralhealthclinic.com at COVID-19. So all of our recordings are on there. Some, like I said before, most of them, probably the billing advice, ignore, but just fast forward to where Julie, Julie talked about cost reporting. That will mainly be the same. Good, good. Okay. So basically what I want to talk about here today is the fact that, let me make sure I'm back here. Um, how are we going to do this? What changed with the, with this? Well, if you're going to do actual time, there's two methods for calculating the carve out that goes down into that telehealth cost center. Uh, in, in my opinion, there may be some other more creative methods, but I've tried to boil it down to the top two, and that is actual time spent. If you want this tracking log, let me know. I can send this directly to you. I think Mark also has it on his website where you actually time in, time out, Make sure you include charting time. Tell us what you did. And then we can use that on the back end as we do the cost report carve outs. Um, the other, when we talked the other day, um, we talked more about using CPT codes, taking, extracting CPT codes from your system. I'm not sure if every system is going to be able to do that with the new code that they've put out. It sounds like, um, I don't know, Doug, no, don't know, Doug, if you're still with us, um, that Azalea has a, has a way to, on the back end, say, of those codes, the, this many were level twos, this many were level threes. If you have a system that can extract that data, I think that we can very easily calculate what that carve out is going to be from that data. So you're gonna either have to keep logs or you're gonna have to work on the back end to be sure that you can produce a report that's gonna say, we did this many five minute calls, we did this many 10 minute, we did this many nine, nine, two, one, threes, four, fives. That's where we were a week ago. We thought we that that was our kind of fail safe, our backup. And I think there are gonna be some systems that are gonna be able to do that. Um, but if you can't, keep this log. The other thing that I wanted to talk about here is when I said use as far as method B because method A is actual time spent where you just really are, are diligent um, and I, I have one of my my star students on the line and I won't even mention her name you know who you are she's been keeping this her folks have been doing this and I'm going to get a log of every telemedicine visit that she in her clinic does. There are others a little late to the game. Maybe your providers aren't all on board and you don't have a log, this log for everybody. If you don't, maybe you can get that log done partially. As far as the Medicare regulations go, it's one week per month, can't be the same week every month when they're talking about base time study regulations. Mark, Mark can attest to that. It's just old school, minimum time studies. So we can apply that a little bit and say, okay, if you don't keep up with it all the time, at least keep up with some of it. And maybe we can extrapolate that and say, in a normal week, we did this many uh, five minute, this, we spent this much time and, and do those carve outs. Takeaway from this is keep a log if you can, get on the phone with your cost report preparers. And I cringe when I say that because I, I'm going to be talking to a lot of people over the next several weeks on what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Um, talk to your back end folks with EMRs to see what they can they pull timestamps? Can they tell you the time? Are, are they that sophisticated? Um, and work with the folks now to see your, your, your cost report folks to know what kind of data you can be capturing for them to do a carve out on the back end. And the back end is going to carve out 
direct time spent doing telehealth. Remember, back from our slides up here, get back over there, back from our slides here, we only pull direct time down in that non-RHC cost center. The overhead will allocate itself on the cost report. And that's all I have. I, I just don't want to belabor that anymore. If you want to go and listen to the original presentation that kind of goes through all of the logic behind that, the changes for today is get with your, your EMR vendor. It sounds like Azalea's got something that, that is going to create that. Um, keep a log, keep a partial log, start it now. Some information is better than none. Thank you, Julie. We, we appreciate it. I tell you what, we are really, and I apologize, it was, it was my doing. I'm the one that got so far behind on on time, and and uh, we just had so many issues in the, the panelist session. I think it worked really well for us to go through some of those issues. Unfortunately, I think the only thing we determined was it was okay to drink during work. <laughs> the other things that, <laughs> that we have to do are there's just there's still a lot of unanswered questions. So maybe. Uh, maybe our best bet to do is as much as as it's sad to say is maybe come back in a week or so when Shannon's got a home she's gonna run over there and do her her thing at Palmetto and find out some things for us and Doug if Doug if you can help us out on this one because you're the CPT master and all that and maybe uh, know how to append and all these sort of claims is maybe we can put together something whenever we get some answers for you guys uh, cool. later on. And, uh, and put together and come back and do another webinar uh, for you guys. Because we've gone two hours. You really, you guys have been wonderful for hanging around. We still have a lot of people still left over at this time. So if y'all want to, Doug, do you have anything? I know we, you, we didn't give you a chance to sort of sort of talk a whole lot during the session, but do you have anything to, to help us as we, as we sort of end, end this session? No, just, uh... <clears throat> I have all these things bookmarked and I would recommend that as well. So like a lot of the, I have y'all the HBS website bookmarked with the resource page that telehealth list bookmarked. We even set a calendar reminder for certain times to recheck things. So uh, I would definitely recommend that because stuff is changing so often. And then when you have to go back and make corrections on claims, uh, the sooner you know what the changes are, the better. So I've got a really long bookmark list of just COVID-19 related web pages that I reference on a regular basis. Okay, Shannon, uh, we didn't give you a chance to do your uh, a presentation either, but uh, do you want to? You have any final words too before we sort of close down the session? No, I'm good. Um, I think that this was fabulous. I think we'll get a lot of additional information from CMS um, and or um, some of the individual Macs, and of course we'll share that information. Um, and if anyone has questions, I know every single one of us will take those emails um so thanks for letting me be on thank you very much thank, thanks to all the panelists i know thank you charles patty julie nathan and nathan i get nathan i guess he's still on the line here nathan i'll let you send us out with some marching orders to go and and uh politic for our rural health clinics on phase four do you have any final marching orders for us for for what we need to do to to support rural health care before we go um, obviously, you know, I, I highly encourage all rural health clinics to contact their federal legislators. Uh, there'll be more detail when and if that legislation that I floated uh, um, is introduced. I think it might be called the Improving Telehealth and, and Medically Underserved Areas Act or something like that. So um, just be on the lookout for that. Uh, we need grassroots support if we want to fix these telehealth issues. Thank you all. Okay. All right, well, thanks to everybody. We're going to close down and uh, we will, unfortunately, I think we may see you next week. So, uh, all right, you have a great weekend and we certainly do, from all of us, we do absolutely appreciate you people that are on the front lines and fighting this war. Uh, you you are the heroes. So thank you very much. And we'll, we'll do our best to be the butler to support you guys while you're Batman. So thank you. Thank you.